Get your Bible. Turn with me to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 22. I want you to find your place. I want you to do me a favor. I want you to get your Bible in your hand, whether it's your hard copy or your electronic copy. I want you to do an exercise with me before we actually look at the text. I want you to get two numbers in your head. First number is this. I want you to number the people in your home today, the number of people in your home. If you're single, you might think about the number of people in your family of origin. So I want you just to to get in your mind, this should be easy for you, the number of people in your home, the number of human beings in your home. So that's easy, yes? All right, here's the next number. I want you to, the best you can, determine the number of Bibles in your home. For some of us, there are too many to count. I want you to remember today how blessed we are that we gather in this place with the entirety of the Word of God in our language, in front of us, and we do it freely. When there are billions of people around the world who have no such gift. So as we open the Word, I don't want us to take that lightly. We never do in this chapel, but I want us to be reminded again of the gift God has given us in His Word. We are a Great Commission seminary. Our president reminded us yesterday of the thousands of unreached people groups around the world, of three billion plus people in the world who have little or no access to the gospel. And so we hear that, we hear that global picture but then I also want us to be reminded that it's not just gold, but this is a North American problem as well. In our nation, by the best estimates, 200 million people in our nation are unchurched. By some studies, only China and India and Indonesia have more lost people than we do. You come all the way home, and our state convention in North Carolina, our, our Baptist state convention, tells us that more than half the people in this state are unchurched. So clearly, our our call is to do the Great Commission. We're to go to the nations and make disciples of of all the people groups. We're to reach out to our neighbors to do that. We do want every classroom here to be a Great Commission classroom. And in my estimation, we do as well as any of our seminaries. In fact, I think we do better than any in focusing on the Great Commission. But you know what? Even we struggle sometimes telling the story of Jesus. We struggle telling the story to our neighbors. Sometimes it's easier for us to leapfrog our neighbors and go to the nations. Sometimes for us, we talk about it and still it's a struggle. So I want us to think about why, why it's a struggle. Maybe, maybe it's fear. We're afraid. I, I, don't know, I don't know how to connect with that person. I don't know how to transition a, a conversation to the gospel. I don't know how that person's going to respond and maybe it's going to cost me too much or Maybe I'm simply afraid of, Lord, if I, if I do what, what Scott asked us to do, what Dr. Hildreth asked us to do, to just say, Lord, yes, I'll go wherever, maybe that's too frightening because God may fill in the blank check in a way that we don't like. What is it that keeps us from doing the Great Commission? Well, here's where I want to take us today. I want us to consider the possibility that maybe we are too tough to do the Great Commission. Maybe we are too strong to do the Great Commission. So let me give you my title. You can write my title down, and then we're going to unpack this. Here's my title. It's first a question. Too tough to do the Great Commission? And then a colon and my subtitle, Remembering the Grace of God. Too tough to do the Great Commission. That's the question. Then, beyond the colon, remembering the grace of God. We go to Luke 22. We're going to look at a number of texts here. We turn to this gospel, this gospel written to Theophilus, 
written to provide for him instruction and guidance in spiritual matters, but, but even more so to provide information about and to direct people to Jesus, the Son of God, who is the Savior for all the world. And we find ourselves in Luke 22 in the Passion Narrative, the story of the coming death of Jesus. And in this chapter, we read of Judas's plot to betray Jesus. We read the story of the, the Lord's Supper that would point to the coming death of Jesus. We read of disciples, even in the midst of that, as the, the cross hangs heavy over the shoulders of Jesus, his disciples are arguing about who's the greatest in the kingdom. We'll read of a leader who says that he will die for Jesus. We'll read of Jesus taking his disciples to the Garden of Gethsemane and that gripping prayer of Jesus as he says, Father, not my will but yours be done. We read of the betrayal of Judas and the arrest of Jesus. And all that is in this chapter. But also in this chapter are two verses that remind us of the power of memory. And so let me show you these as bookends of our text today. Look with me at Luke chapter 22, verse 19. Jesus instituting the Lord's Supper. And the text says, and he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in what? Tell me. In remembrance of me. Do this in remembrance of me. Do this that you will remember my death. Now, go with me to the latter part of the chapter. Chapter 22, verse 61. This is following the denials of Simon Peter, and we'll unpack his story here. But I want you to see this verse, 2261. And the Lord turned and looked at Peter. And Peter, what? Remembered the saying of the Lord. How he had said to him, before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. Remember, the power of memory. Jesus said, do this, remember me. We read of Peter, he remembered the words of the Lord. And so this text where we'll camp out, bookended by these reminders of the power to remember. So I want us to remember today. Here's point number one. As we strive to do the Great Commission, we must remember that Jesus prays for us. We must remember that Jesus prays for us. Go with me to Luke 22, verse 31. Jesus speaks to Simon Peter. He speaks these words, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you, that he might sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. Peter said to him, Lord, I am ready to go with you both to prison and to death. And Jesus said, I tell you, Peter, the rooster will not crow this day until you deny three times that you know me. Look again at verse 32. But I have prayed for you. So go with me into this, into this narrative. Jesus speaks to Simon. He calls him emphatically twice, Simon, Simon. Satan has asked permission to, to sift all of you disciples, to put you on a sieve and just shake you violently perhaps in an attempt to show that some of you will fail miserably under the stress of severe testing. And I'm thinking if I'm Simon Peter and Jesus says to me, Satan's asked permission. If I'm Peter, I'm thinking, well, did you tell him no? <laughs> uh, what, did you, what did you say to him? I've watched you walk on water. I've watched you heal the sick. I've watched you raise the dead. You can keep the devil off my back. But there is no such answer here. What Jesus says is this, I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail, that it will not give out, that it will not disappear completely. So apparently, something severe is about to happen here. Clearly, Jesus is hinting at some severe trial that's going to take place, and Simon Peter's faith is going to be stretched to its limit. But it will not fail ultimately. He will return, and here's why. Because Jesus prays for him. As I prayed for you. You see, the same Jesus that gives the enemy permission to sift Simon Peter and all the disciples is the Jesus who prays him through the conflict. He never leaves him alone. 
He gives the enemy permission to attack, but Jesus prays him through the battle. And thus, Jesus must have had a reason for this. He obviously had a purpose for this, and we learn something about that in verse 33. Look at Peter's response. Peter said to him, Lord, I am ready to go with you both to prison and to death. We're going to learn that Peter is overconfident. And we're going to learn that Jesus, in allowing the enemy to test Simon Peter, and even as Peter falls, Jesus never being pleased with Peter's decision and never being pleased with Peter's sin, Jesus, in fact, going to the cross to die for what Peter is doing, God still superintends it all to teach Simon Peter that he's not nearly as tough as he thinks he is. And he says, I'll go with you to prison and to death. How easy it is to say those words. How easy it is to, to go there in our words only, and how easy it might be for us to do the same thing today, to say, Lord, I will go with you anywhere. I will die for you. How easy it is to rely on our training and our education and our pedigree and our, our past successes and our past ministries and our knowledge and our calling. How easy it is to go there until it's your neck in the noose. Simon Peter says, I will, I will die for you. He's overconfident. And here's what Peter reminds us. Here's what Peter teaches us. We, like him, every one of us in this room, is but one dumb decision away from falling. Yes or no? Every single one of us is but one dumb decision away from falling. Now, I'm not talking about losing our salvation. I'm talking about wounding our relationship with God to the extent that we're no longer an effective witness for him. And every one of us could this day make a decision that takes us there. And if you don't think it can happen to you, you're destined for trouble. And what's our hope? Jesus is praying for us. What's our hope? The intercessor. The Son is at the right hand of the Father ever making intercession for us, praying that God would sanctify us, praying that we might ultimately be protected from the evil one. And you see, when we get that right, when we remember that Jesus is praying for us, things just change. We've got hope in temptation when we know Jesus is praying for us. We don't have to lose when the Son of God's praying for us. We can press on in the spiritual battle when we know Jesus is praying for us. We can stand in the confidence of his righteousness and his grace when we know Jesus is praying for us. And hear me, when we know Jesus is praying for us, we can go anywhere and speak to anybody for God's glory. We can do the work of the Great Commission, whether it means to go to our neighbor or to the nations, when we know Jesus is interceding for us. We need to remember today that Jesus is praying for us. Here's point number two. We must remember that overconfidence leads to failure and missed opportunities. We must remember that overconfidence leads to failure and missed opportunities. Now listen to me, even as you write that down, let me make a point about overconfidence. Here's, here's the problem with overconfidence. You don't recognize you're there until it's too late. True? I mean, when do we learn that we're overconfident? After we fall. We don't run around saying, hey, you know what, I'm overconfident. We don't recognize that until we're in trouble. So I, I want you to keep that in mind. Overconfidence leads to failure and missed opportunities. Watch this pattern for Peter. First of all, he says in verse 33, Lord, I'm ready to go with you both to prison and to death. He's overconfident. That's the first problem. Now watch what he does. Go with me to verse 45, same chapter. Jesus has taken three of his disciples with him. He's called them to pray that they not enter into temptation. Verse 45 says, and when he rose from prayer, he came to the disciples and found them sleeping for sorrow. And he said to them, why are you sleeping? Rise and pray that you may not enter into temptation. He's not praying. He's weary, like all the disciples. And listen to me, students. Faculty, we have the same issues here. Listen to this here. Overconfidence 
plus weariness plus prayerlessness are an equation for trouble. When we're overconfident and we're worn out and we're not praying, we're in the target of the enemy. And that's where Peter finds himself. And then go with me to verse 50, same chapter. Judas has now betrayed Jesus. And verse 50 says, and one of them struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his right ear. Now we learn from another gospel writer, this one is Simon Peter. So we watch Peter doing what he said he would do. He would defend Jesus. He defends Jesus, but he does it according to his own plan. He's operating according to his own ability, his own idea of what God wants. And that's always dangerous. Go to verse 54. Watch the way that Simon Peter falls. He's overconfident. He's not praying. He's operating in his own ability. Verse 54, same chapter. Then they seized him and led him away, bringing him into the high priest's house. And Peter was following at a distance. Now, we know this is a geographic distance. But we're also going to learn that his heart is getting increasingly distanced from Jesus here. And he will find himself sitting among the enemy. Keep reading in verse 55. And when they had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and sat down together, Peter sat down among them. Then a servant girl, seeing him as he sat in the light and looking closely at him, said, this man also was with him. But he denied it, saying, woman, I do not know him. And a little later, someone else saw him and said, you also are one of them. But Peter said, man, I'm not. And after an interval of about an hour, still another insisted, certainly this man also was with him for he too is a Galilean. Peter said, man, I do not know what you're talking about. And immediately while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed. Watch this fall. Watch the confrontation. First of all, a servant girl comes to Jesus, staring intently at him in the dim light. And she likely had seen him come into that courtyard with John, Jesus' beloved disciple who who got them entrance into the courtyard. And she says, you're one of his. And Peter says, no, I'm not. Then there's a second time, it it seems from all the Gospels that Peter's trying to make his way out, and there are several standing around, and they're saying to him, you're one of his, and Peter says, I'm not one of his followers. And then there's a third time, there's a third time when a relative of the servant whose ear Peter cut off in the garden said, you're one of his, didn't I see you in the garden? And others around are saying, we know by your accent that you must be one of his. And Peter erupts in cursing and swearing, and he says for a third time, I'm not his. I'm not his. And within a matter of hours, the one who said, I will die for you, says he doesn't even know Jesus. He said it wouldn't happen to him, but it did. His overconfidence has now led to absolute failure. But here's what I want you to see. Watch what happens to the possibilities of evangelism here. So I want you to see this. Here's Peter, and here comes a servant girl and says, you're a follower of Jesus. Tell me something, wouldn't you like it if once in a while the lost person started the conversation? Wouldn't you like it if somebody came up and said, now now hear me, for some of our brothers and sisters around the world, that very conversation can lead to their death. Still, wouldn't you like it if somebody said, you're a follower of Jesus, aren't you? And the door's wide open to launch into the gospel and say, yes, I'm a follower of Jesus. But Peter misses it. He gets a second chance. And he could have said, he could have said, all right, everybody in this courtyard, listen to me. I missed it the first time. I said I'm not a follower of Jesus, but I am. So hear me. I love him, and I will die for him. He misses it the second time. He gets a third chance, and one more time, he denies knowing Jesus. He misses it all three times. But you see, that's what happens when we live for ourselves. That's what happens when we're guarding our own neck. That's what happens when we're living for ourselves and not for Jesus and not for others who need the gospel. So whether we do it in blatant denial or subtle neglect, we do the same thing when we're living in our own power and our own strength and we live in overconfidence and we walk right past the people who need Jesus. Overconfidence leads to failure, missed opportunities. At at the risk of At the risk of minimalizing this denial of Jesus from Simon Peter, let me tell you how I learned this. I was was pastoring a church in Ohio many years now, 
ago. I was, I was a young pastor. I and one of my deacons went to visit a young guy in our community and we, we got there, we sat in his house and we talked to him for a couple hours and God was doing great things in our church and I was so excited about being a pastor and so we talked for hours about what God was doing in the church. God did this and God did this and God did this and I couldn't wait to tell him everything that God was using me as the pastor to do. We had gotten an award because our church was doing so many baptisms and I love telling that story. Well, this young guy came back to our church, and a few weeks later, he came to know Christ. And, and God just oozed out of him. He's one of those guys, just, he just brings the fire of God with him. And so I asked him if he would share his testimony with our church, and he agreed to do so. I couldn't wait for him to get up before our people and tell the story, because I knew his fire was so real. And here was the, here's the picture. He comes to the pulpit. In our church, there was a little pew right here where the pastor would sit. So I'm sitting right here watching my congregation. I'm beaming because I can't wait for him to tell the story. And he gets up there and he starts to tell the story. And here's what he says. He says, Brother Chuck and his uncle, Brother Chuck and my uncle came that night to speak to me and they talked to me for a couple of hours and here's what he said. I kept waiting for them to get to Jesus and they never got there. Now, remember, I'm sitting right here looking at my congregation. I remember thinking, Lord, I don't understand everything about your second coming, but come back right now. (laughs) Uh, Just. Just, just take us all out of here so I don't ever have to face, because he stood there before my people and said their pastor never got to Jesus. I said, Lord, God, don't let it ever happen again. And I don't doubt it has, but how many times, how many times do we miss it? I heard him say that that day, and my silence about Jesus and my conversation for him became as deafening to me as the roar of Peter's denial in that courtyard. Our overconfidence leads to failure, and it leads to missed opportunities, and it reminds us that sometimes we are too strong to do the Great Commission. Let's go to point number three. We must remember that God uses broken people to do the Great Commission. We must remember that God uses broken people to do the Great Commission. Look with me again at chapter 22, verse 56. This is Peter, his denial again. A servant girl, look at it closely. Verse 56 says, Then the servant girl, seeing him as he sat in the light and looking closely at him, staring at him, eyeball to eyeball with him, said, This man also was with him. But he denied it. Saying, Woman, I do not know him. You see, in this text, there are two people who look at Simon Peter. Two people who catch his eyeballs. The first is this servant girl. She looks at him. Face to face, you're one of his. Peter says, no, I'm not. Three times then, he denies even knowing Jesus. And then look with me at verse 60, same chapter, the third denial, but Peter said, man, I do not know what you're talking about. And immediately, while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed. That's what Jesus said would happen. And then verse 61, Luke adds this detail that no other gospel writer picks up on. And the Lord turned and looked at Peter. And Peter remembered the saying of the Lord, how he had said to him, before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. Listen to the words again. And the Lord turned and looked at Peter. The Lord turned, the, the betrayed one, the arrested one, the beaten one, The one who is on his way to the cross, as I said, for what Peter had just done, turns and looks straight at the fleeing disciple. And his look melts the fisherman. His rebellion is reduced to sobs. For you see, God superintended all of this 
that Peter might learn just how far he can fall. He's not nearly as strong as he thinks he is. But so he might also learn that he can't fall so far that Jesus can't see him. The Son of God, as he's headed to his death, locks eyeballs with Simon Peter. And all Peter can do is cry like a baby. He's the rugged fisherman just hours before, and now he's the sobbing disciple. Out of control with grief. But listen to me, this begins a process for Peter to become the one who in Acts 2 will stand up and proclaim the gospel and God will mow down Jerusalem in the power of the Holy Spirit. How does that happen? When Peter is on his face before God, when Peter is crying like a baby, he begins a process of learning God's love will trump his rebellion. He begins a process of learning that God's mercy is overwhelming. He begins a process of learning that Jesus always knows where he is. And he begins a process of learning just how desperately he needs Jesus. And all of that will culminate, all of that will culminate when the angels at the tomb say to the women, go, tell the disciples that Jesus is alive, and when you do that, don't forget Peter, because he's still in the family. And I can imagine Simon Peter telling that story to, the, to Mark as he records that, and we read in Mark 16, I can imagine Peter saying to Mark, and Mark, let me tell you the story. The angel said, my name. Tell the disciples and Peter, because I was still God's. And you see, when Peter is on his face weeping, Jesus has prayed him into brokenness and repentance and forgiveness. And I would suggest to you that Simon Peter, on his face, broken, is more ready to be a witness for the gospel than he was as the rugged fisherman who said, I'll die for Jesus. He's broken, but in his brokenness, he's beginning to learn what grace is all about. You see, we witness most and we will do the Great Commission most when we recognize just how needy we are and how gracious God is. It's why, it's one of the reasons why we most witness when we first saved, because grace is real to us. You see, our problem is this, we get over grace. Because we're tough, because we're strong, because we're trained. So what does that mean? Does that mean we all need to go out and sin like Simon Peter? Of course not. Paul tells you, well, you know better than that. But it may well mean we better remember. We better remember just how lost we were. We better remember what Jesus did for us on the cross. We better remember that we really cannot take a step that really makes a dent in the darkness were it not for the grace of God. And we better remember that were it not for a Redeemer who prays for us and a Spirit who lives in us, every one of us can fall like Simon Peter. I think we're too strong to do the Great Commission because we've gotten over grace. You know what we need God to do? Bring us back to our face. Break us again. I don't know where you are today. As we begin this semester, it may be that there's sin in your life, and the truth is you're hiding it. My prayer for you is God will break you just as the words of Jesus would have sliced Simon Peter in two, before tomorrow comes, before dawn breaks, before the rooster crows, you will deny me. We need to hear those same words. It can happen to you. Or I pray for you today, if, if you've got it all together 
and, and you're here hoping you can teach everybody else what you already know, I pray God will break you in two. Because you won't tell the story about Jesus unless you're broken. You'll tell your story, and that doesn't matter. You'll tell everybody how tough you are. And only the mercy of God will protect you from yourself. We just need to remember. August the 18th of 1974. Just a couple days over 41 years ago. God made me his child and called me to preach. First time in church in my life. I went there because my seventh grade classmate was telling me the gospel every day and he was driving me crazy, so I decided to go to church one time to get him off my back. And God rocked my world that day. Here's what I love about Jesus. He really does get sweeter. He really does. Unless we make the story about us. We need to remember. Let me pray. Father, Father, remind us of where we were. Remind us of where we could be. Remind us of what we could do. Remind us of grace today. God, I pray that we would be so overwhelmed by your grace, broken under your love, that we couldn't help but tell somebody about Jesus. It would just come out of us because grace is fresh and alive and real. And the story is about you and not about us. Lord, do what you must in our lives to bring us to brokenness that when we stand and speak about grace, we do so because grace is so real. Thank you for second chances, Lord. Thank you that you see us even when we fall. If any of my brothers and sisters in this room are falling as we speak, I pray they would see that you see them right now and you call them back. Lord, may this be a day of victory. May we go from this place announcing the name of Jesus to our neighbors and to the nations. We remember God and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.